Hey friends, uh, this is a video for the Calc 3 class. We're going to be looking at the chain rule today. We have a little bit of difficulty with respect to this because uh, the initial design for a third semester of calculus course ought to have a lot of stuff going on about vectors, but we have had a redesign where we pushed all of the vector stuff into Calc 4 and then that means some of the multivariable stuff where it's super easy to phrase it in terms of vectors. We, we don't have that behind us. So I'm going to try a little bit uh, occasionally to maybe produce some extra videos on the side for those of you who do know what's going on with vectors. Okay. But in particular with the chain rule, <coughs> um, we have to look at the way that we're tackling that, okay? Uh, we can't really phrase it in terms of doing dot products of vectors because dot products and vectors, both things we have not done. But we're going to try to take a look uh, here at stuff and I am implicitly assuming that you've written something down. Maybe I better go ahead and put that on the front page of these notes. Um, yay, it worked. Okay, so the thing that I am implicitly assuming that y'all have written down is this little bit here where you're thinking about a variable that is your final result. I'm gonna say Z and maybe it is given to you in terms of two other variables, x and y, right? So x and y together decide what z is. And then the t variable maybe decides what x and y are. So consequently, when we try to write something about dz and dt, we have to think about what contributes to changes in Z, and we'll say the partial of Z with respect to X, since Z is a, is a function of two variables, it's a partial derivative, times then DX DT, because X is only decided by T, it's uh, not a partial derivative, but just a regular derivative, plus your rate of change that comes from the y branching, you'll have the partial of z with respect to y times dy dt, okay? You could have more variables sitting down at the bottom of this. And so consequently, you might, at, you might be talking about partials for your t rather than just regular derivative, so. Anyway, that's the basic notion of what we do in this, is to look at derivatives in terms of those. So here we've got an example where our w is x squared y minus y squared, and our x is gonna be given to us by sine t and y is given to us by e to the t. So it's asking us to use the chain rule to find dw dt. And you have to notice, I'm trying to give you instructions to give you a hint as to what I'm looking for. If you're in the section about the chain rule, I expect you to use the chain rule, okay? The reason I say this is, hypothetically, you could just plug sine t in for x and e to the t in for y, and you could take that derivative, and it wouldn't use the chain rule, and so you wouldn't get full credit. So. I need you to pay attention to what we're trying to accomplish here, all right? So just writing out how this uh, chain rule works, W with respect to T, we have to think that W could change because of the X and then the X could change with uh, respect to T. Same thing going in the direction of the Y and I said, something other than what I wanted to write, going the direction of the y, and then you'd have the dy dt in there as well. 
Well, you can take a look at that partial of w with respect to x and see that you're going to get a 2xy and then that the minus y squared, its derivative will just be zero. Then the dx dt, the derivative of the sine t is cosine t, and you just put that in there. And then you say uh, plus, now the partial of z with respect to y, you're going to get an x squared minus and then a 2y. And then your derivative of y with respect to t, derivative of e to the t is just e to the t. Okay? You're not done. Oh, make sure you realize that's not the end of it. Because at present, that is a hellacious mess. It's got three different variables in it. Because you're talking about dw dt, we really implicitly expect for you to get the final answer in terms of t alone. There are some times in context where you wouldn't bother to do that, but if you can, you do. So I'm going to say two times the x we said was sine t, the uh, y we said was e to the t, and then we got a cosine t there at the end. And we'll go back and tidy this up in a minute. So then the x squared will just be sine squared t minus 2 the y is e to the t, and then an e to the t there. So, tidying up, I like to put my trig functions together like that. And then for this other part, I've got a sine squared t e to the t, and a minus 2 e to the 2t. And that's fine. You can totally just leave it like that. If you spot hey, that happens to be the sine of 2t, and you want to write that in there, you can totally do that. That's, that's no problem. Similarly, this sine squared here, if you'd like to write that in terms of cosine 2t, you could do that and simplify it more. But in mind the way it is, okay? Um, hmm. Actually, let me back off on that and make one quick point here. Do you notice that there's a factor I can take out of the whole thing? e to the t. So 2 sine t cosine t plus sine squared t minus 1. Nope, I said minus 1. What was I thinking? Minus 2. All right. So that's perfectly fine there. But the main thing that you need to note is that we're using this chain rule here. And you got to think about all of the different routes. Oh, wait, somebody showed me this uh, other feature I've got on my note taking app, app here. I've got to make sure and use it. So we're going to think about this here. Haha, isn't that cool? Okay. And it is really given to us by this diagram here. And this part where we say uh, w with respect to x and x with respect to t, we can just think about that as being the change that flows from changing t through x, and then similarly for y on the other part, All right? Okay, so let me um, page on to another one here. Now this one, I wrote a lot of it out ahead of time because it's, it's a mess, right? Uh, it's an example I stole from another textbook, and it says, in case you can't read my writing, two objects are traveling along paths, and those paths are going to be those given by this x1, y1. So that is going to be a uh, an ellipse that has a length, uh, I'm sorry, a horizontal radius of four and a vertical radius of two. So that's really going to be this guy right here. Uh, so you've got something that is traveling along that ellipse there. Then the other ellipse, you've got something that's traveling along it, but it's traveling twice as fast. Notice that sine 2t, that cosine 2t that's in there. So, uh, what is the rate of change of their distance, the distance between them, when the value of t is equal to pi, right? So, in looking at that, you're going to have to calculate the distance between them. 
and that's going to have your x1 minus x2 squared and your y1 minus y2 squared. It's, it's just the, the distance formula, right? But now x1, x2, y1, y2, we've got four different things here that your distance is in terms of. So you can think about your z and your x1, your x2, your x3. Oh, what the hell was I saying? That's not an x3. It's supposed to be a y1 and y2. And each of those is determined by t. So now you have a much more complicated diagram that you've got, but you really only have these four terms that you have to put out of it. So you're going to have to think about taking the z there and taking its partial with respect to each one of those variables, x1, x2, y1, y2. Okay, so I went ahead and did that here. So what you have to remember is you have that uh, quantity under the square root. When you take the derivative of a square root, you will have one half of stuff to the minus one half power. So that's why you have the square root at the bottom. And then on the top, you would have to take the derivative of this x1 minus x2 quantity squared, because that's got your x1 in it. So you'd have two times the x1 minus x2. And so you would have had two on the top and the bottom, and they would have canceled out, all right? So I am a little bit lazy here, and I don't want to write all that stuff under the square root all the time, so I've just written the word stuff. Okay, so stuff, stuff, stuff. All right, when you take the derivative with respect to x2, because it's got a minus on it, that's why you pick up this minus one there. Then the y1 is going to work pretty much like the x1 did, and the y2 is going to work pretty much like the, like the x2 did. Uh, then down here, we've just gone to each one of these and taken its derivative in turn and written those down for later reference. Okay. Now, because of the fact we have a particular point in time where the points are at those places there, we're going to look at the rate of change of the distance when we plug in t equals pi, right? So since we actually have those particular points there, then the square root, the stuff there, you can actually just calculate it. So here on the next page, I've gone ahead and done that, okay? So um, if you plug in on the x1, y1, you get the point negative four, zero, and on the x2, y2, you get the point zero, three, right? And so that means the distance between them, the square root of that stuff, turns out to be five. So when we go back to the expression for the partial of z with respect to x1, the top of it said x1 minus x2, and the bottom said the square root of the stuff. So we can just say negative four minus zero, and we can just say five. Similarly here, we had then uh, the negative four minus zero, but we had to multiply it by a negative one. That's why it's positive now. And here we had just plugging in the uh, zero minus three on top. And here we had the zero minus three, but then times a negative, okay? Then those dx dt's, which were listed on the previous page, sorry, uh, um, but that when you plug in the pi, you will end up with a zero, a four, a negative two, and a zero. And on our uh, written out derivative of z with respect to t, we're going to then just have each of these products. Negative four fifths times zero, four fifths times four, negative three fifths times negative two, and three fifths times zero. So we really only have to worry about this one here and this one here. And when you total them up, you end up getting 22 fifths. Um, what does the actual quantity do for you? Eh. If you were doing some sort of an approximation, 
<clears throat> scheme that depended on it, you could use that. Uh, for our purposes, what's mostly going to be important is that it's positive. Okay. So <clears throat> then I cleverly slipped something past you here that on this problem statement, we also have this question here. When is that distance between the two objects going to be at the minimum? That is a little bit deceptive because of the fact that we have a static picture here. We see that this object is going around here and this one's going around here and their paths intersect, but they end up at points on the path at different times. So they don't really intersect. Well, they intersect, but they don't collide. How's that? So we'll take a quick look here about answering the minimum distance question, right? So to answer that minimum distance question, I'm gonna cheat. And instead of taking the square root in the distance, I'm just gonna take the distance squared. It turns out that the square of the distance and the distance will be minimum at the same places. It's a common trick that we do a lot in math when we're minimizing things. So, uh, so in any case, to make that not have four derivatives, I just had x squared plus y squared, and I made the x be the difference in those two x's and the y be the difference in the y's, okay? Then my dzdt looks a lot more like the previous application that we had for it. And now we can just plug in what each of those things are. So since it says 2x, we'll have 2, and we'll have the expression for x. And since it says dy or dx dt, we'll just put that in. And then on the other one, we'll just put that in. And that expression is miserable. You, you remember Calc 1, okay? And you remember, I hope, trying to find maximums and minimums of stuff. And it's just not practical on this particular thing for you to actually try to solve for what the t values are. If you multiply all that out, stuff is not going to cancel nicely. So I went to my good friend Desmos. Yay. And I just got a quick graph of this. Now, with regards to the graph, I went ahead and just indicated here are two minimums that are at the same distance down. And my function is going to have a period and it's going to repeat and go through there. So I just want to look at one period, not every possible period. Okay. And I want a minimum. Do y'all remember the first derivative test? Probably not. But since we are plotting dz dt here, we're looking at the derivative and at a minimum, the derivative goes from being negative to being positive. So that means that the actual graph was going down and then goes up. And that's where minimums will occur. So I just spotted where those points were real quick, where it moved from a negative to a positive derivative. And I just wrote the numbers down, okay? Once I got the numbers, I plugged them back into the expression that I've got for z, and I got 1.7 something for a couple of them, and then one of them I got a one, okay? So that is really our setup of what we do for getting, um, getting maximums or minimums. We look for critical points where maximum or minimum occurs, and then we plug back in to see what the values are. So. You might have one like this in the homework, and I might be hinting to you that you're probably going to have to go to a graphing utility to get a good picture of it. Here's the thing. You're going to turn it in in homework, so go to an online graphing utility. And once it's got that graph of the two-dimensional thing, just take a screenshot and include it into your final, final answer. Okay? So, all right. So let's take a look at another one here. And this is where we start to have more, com more complicated things happening. So this W is, divided, is decided by X and Y. 
but each of x and y is decided by s and t. So when we start talking about the partial of w with respect to s, we have to think of this part of the diagram. We will have a partial of w with respect to x, and then we'll have a partial of x with respect to s. Notice it is, with, it is a partial this time because of the fact that um, we have the two variables there. Plus, the other part will have a partial of w with respect to y and partial of y with respect to s. Okay, and I'm going to grab this and just toss it out of the way here. So, if we want to look at back here, our partial of w with respect to x is just going to be 2y. Our partial of x with respect to s is just going to be 2s plus our partial of w with respect to y is going to be 2x and our partial of y with respect to s is going to be 1 over t. I gave you all the tip before that your final answer should be in terms of the, ver the final variables. So in this case, s's and t's. So I'm going to have four times y was really s over t and then times s plus two times x was this s squared plus t squared and then times one over t. You can tidy that up if you'd like to. Um, and what does this turn into? Let's see. Um, it looks like we're going to have this bit here being uh, 4s squared over t, but we'll also end up with a 2s squared over t. So we might as well put those together and have 6s squared over t plus then uh, 2, gosh, I started to say 2t squared over t, but nobody would fail to simplify that, would they? So I'll put it down as just 2t. Okay. All right. Now we're going to do the, this partial with respect to t. And so pretty much like before, but now our diagram has the t branches going on it. And I am going to, as before, move this out of my way, but I'm going to write down the partial w with respect to x times the partial of x with respect to t plus the partial of w with respect to y, partial of y with respect to t. So we can run through, through those pretty fast since some of them we've done before. And then let's see, y with respect to t is going to be a little bit different, negative s over t squared. So we have four times we said y was s over t times t, those will cancel, plus two times we said the x was s squared plus t squared times this negative s over t squared. So 4s plus um, if we just go ahead and distribute through there, it's actually going to be not a plus, but a minus 2s cubed over t squared, and then minus uh, 2, well, gosh, just 2s right there. And so then you might make that further into a niceness of that. All right. So um, that's the sort of stuff we're doing there. If you then had uh, values for your t that you needed to plug in there for your s and your t, uh, you might go ahead and do that. But this particular problem was just asking us more generally to get that bit of it. So all right, let's rush right along to another example here. So this example is taking advantage of this formula that we've got. It says that uh, if you have your function 
f of x, y, z, and you want to get the partial of z with respect to x, it will turn out to be the negative of f sub x over f sub z, okay? If you're like me and you're like, how in the hell am I gonna remember that? Well, that is the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to z. So it kind of looks like they ought to cancel out there, right? But in any case, in order to actually use this, we're gonna take our function f that it started with. And if you're saying, oh my God, where did he get that f? Look up there at the actual equation that we're dealing with. I just took the left-hand side, the stuff that wasn't a constant. And so once I had that, then I just took the f sub x and the f sub z. And uh, once I took those derivatives there, I went ahead and plugged in the actual point that we're needing to think about these on and uh, got these values of negative six and nine. And then the partial of z with respect to x, when you plug in that point, is just gonna get negative of negative six over nine, so two thirds. So that's, that's what we're doing there, all right? So this, um, this answers a question that somebody had um, on one of the videos one day, how do you get the tangent plane to a sphere? Because we don't want to have to solve and say z equals square root of blah, 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 and yucky stuff like that. This lets us do that directly anytime that you have a level surface, surface there. So, all right, that gets you some examples. It should get you going. Um, I'll see you all in class.